Hi all, my name is Bonnie Perry and I am the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan. I am delighted for all of you to be with us tonight for our webinar, uh, The Pandemic and Poverty, a Theological and Public Policy Conversation. And um, we've got a number of um, really interesting folks who are with us this evening. Our panelists, uh, we have uh, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. Kelly is, um, she is the Dean and the President of the Episcopal Divinity School, uh, which is now located at Union Theological Seminary, a place that is near and dear to my heart. Kelly's also the Canon Theologian at our National Cathedral and has done an inordinate amount of work on um, uh, womanist theology, black theology, uh, the role of class and um, race and, and all of our thinking about where uh, and how God is made manifest in our lives. So I'm delighted that Dr. Douglas is with us today. Um, we also have Luke Schaefer with us and Luke is a professor of social justice and social policy at the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy and the professor of social work all at the University of Michigan. Um, Luke is uh, the director of Poverty Solutions and Poverty Solutions is a presidential initiative of the University of Michigan and really looking for ways to partner with folks um, and come up with pragmatic solutions um, to addressing poverty. Luke is also a parishioner at St. Clair's in Ann Arbor. Want to do a shout out for them. Um, and Luke, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Schaefer. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carla Bazold is currently the um, chief epidemiologist for the Detroit Health Department. Um, and she is, oh my goodness, working and working in the midst of the My New City and how um, we are addressing all that is happening with the COVID virus. And Dr. Bezold, I know you must be so incredibly busy at this point. So please know how grateful we are that you've taken time out to be with us this evening. Thank you so very much. Um, in this world right now, friends, um, you, you, I know you're reading the newspapers and what's going on. In many ways, um, we can look at the way our society, our country is structured and we can say that there have always been cracks um, that people have fallen through. To be fair, I think they're, they're never cracks unless you're looking at them from the top. Um, right now, the, our world, there are chasms and the way the COVID virus, it is, knows no boundary, knows, it affects race and class across all of it. That said, it is wreaking havoc and having so much more of a devastating effect on those populations, uh, those people, our sisters and brothers who happen to be poor and particularly people who happen to have black or brown skins. It is just wreaking havoc in those communities. And, and it is that, that issue that I would like to address this evening. Um, and so what I'm hoping um, is for each of our panelists, and I'd like to start with Dr. Douglas, go then to Dr. Schaefer, and then to Dr. Bezold, to give us a perspective on this issue. Um, and I'm, what I'm looking for right now is about five minutes from your position on how you see this pandemic, how you see co the COVID-19 virus um, playing havoc in the midst of people who are affected by poverty. Five minutes each on that from your perspective. And then I'd like to get into some conversation, question and answer. If you are part of the group that's watching, um, then I would invite you to access the question and answer box and you can post your questions there and we'll be getting to those questions um, probably the last 20 minutes or so of our conversation. So um, that's, that's where we're going. Um, and again, thank you very much. So Dr. Douglas, um, 
Come be with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, first of all, Bishop Perry, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion and for having uh, this discussion. This is precisely the kind of discussion that uh, the church, faith leaders uh, widely must be having because I continue to believe, and it is even more so the case during this crisis, that the faith community has to claim its voice and take the lead in bringing us to a different place, uh, that a place different from which this crisis has revealed. So let me say a bit about that and why. First of all, as you stated in the introduction, this COVID-19 crisis, this global pandemic has indeed revealed, especially in our country, an ongoing yet often ignored crisis, a true pandemic of endemic injustice and gross and growing inequity and inequality. And of course, both of these things, if you will, are shaped and defined by systemic and structural racism. If this no, this crisis wasn't clear before as it was to those who have suffered from this, it, it has been made clear through what we are seeing in terms of the way COVID is impacting, especially persons of color, brown and black people in this country. Now, why is that the case? It is not oftentimes we hear in various uh, media that in fact it is the fault of black and brown people that we are being more greatly impacted by the COVID uh, crisis with all the myths that people are suggesting uh, that brown and black people didn't take this crisis and have not taken it seriously. Well, in fact, we know that that's not the case, right? Pew studies have revealed to us that in fact, uh, the black community as well as the Latinx community find this more threatening than the white community. And so it's not the fact that we have not taken this seriously. What has not been taken seriously is the systemic and structural racism that have indeed created conditions, what I like to call crucifying conditions for in which disproportionate numbers of brown and black people are subjected and live in daily. And so when we talk about poverty, we are talking about poverty. Yes, there are people who are not of color who are impacted by poverty. We know that, but we also know that disproportionately people of color are impacted by it. 20 point 20.8% or so of black people live in poverty. One in three black children live in poverty. We know that 25% of Native Americans live in poverty. We also know that 17 to 18% of uh, Latinx people live in poverty. So the conditions of poverty are not life producing. It also means that these are the, also the very persons who have inadequate health care. Uh, uh, and the very persons that also, when they seek health care, are getting inadequate health care, right? They aren't insured and getting inadequate health care. So that's on one side of the problem. Then the, the other side of the problem in terms of being impacted uh, disproportionately by this virus is the fact that the people we yes healthcare workers are essential workers but the other people that we have deemed essential workers are what i like to call the essential non-essentials right and so the people who are uh delivery uh persons uh grocery store checkers uh mail delivers etc cetera, etc cetera, that have been bus drivers that have been deemed essential but never treated as essential they are the non-essentials in the society and all of a the sudden they become essential and they are exposed more to the virus they are also less likely to have protective gear and again 
insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So it is no surprise that we see the disproportionate numbers of brown and black persons being in brown and black communities being impacted by this virus. This crisis, health crisis, is revealing another crisis of systemic uh, and structural racism uh, and hence injustice and growing inequality. So what this means for the faith community and for the church, and this, and this is uh, you know, where I became particularly concerned because we can point fingers at uh, social and political institutions. The point of the matter is this injustice and this growing inequality has happened on our watch. And so it seems to me that we as church, we as faith leaders are being called to account. You know, I like to always say to call ourselves church within the uh, Christian faith tradition is aspirational. Uh, uh, we are called to live into in this crisis what it means to be church. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. We know that the word for crisis also means opportunity. It's a Kairos time. This is an opportunity for us to, in fact, live into the best of who we can be, not only as a nation, as a country, as people, but it is an opportunity for us to live into who we can be as church. So that always starts from the bottom up. If in fact, right, with the crucified classes of people, with the people who are most impacted by injustice, that if we began to address the needs of those people whom we have considered expendable in this country, then in fact, if we start from the bottom up, then in fact, we can begin to close the gap between where we are and a more just future. That is the responsibility of those of us who are faith leaders to boldly, boldly fill that breach and lift our voices and make sure that those who have been considered expendable in this country don't now with this virus become disposable. And I'll say more to that later, but that's our task and that's my concern. And that's why it is important to have this kind of conversation. Dr. Douglas, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really struck by the Kairos time and we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. Dr. Luke Schaefer, your perspective, if you might, please. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I want to give a shout out to St. John's Clinton, where I attend church as well as uh, St. Clair's. Um, so thanks for this opportunity. So I'm faculty at the University of Michigan and I run a center called Poverty Solutions, and we do try to partner with policymakers and communities on new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And we get to work with the Detroit Health Department with Carla, as well as other uh, parts of city government and state government in Michigan. And I've really been focused on the economic impacts of the current crisis, uh, broadly speaking. I, um, I know a bit about health, and I'm going to offer a few remarks on that. But really thinking about what makes this crisis different. We've had the Great Recession, right? A really long period of unemployment. We've had other economic slowdowns in the past. <clears throat> but I think uh, this chart in particular tells us a little bit about uh, what really makes this crisis different, is that it came on faster than anything we've ever experienced. So this is weekly unemployment insurance claims filed in Michigan over the course of the last few months. And you see they're ticking downwards uh, during January, uh, February, and the beginning of March uh, with actually one of the best economies that we've had in a long time. Still not as many of the jobs we'd really like to have, right? And there, were tr there was trouble in the labor market, but this was just an incredible shock to the system. When we had 128,000 people file for unemployment insurance a few weeks ago, that was the most in history. And then the next few weeks blew that out of the water, right? Just the difference between those two weeks would have been the most we'd ever had in history. So you are talking about an economic crisis that didn't, isn't just the biggest that we've had in terms of loss with unemployment. Uh, 
it is the fastest that that's ever came on. Usually we have an opportunity to ramp up, right? And know that things are moving in the wrong direction. And that's why I think you find uh, programs, public programs like the unemployment insurance line that's just completely unprepared to deal with a crisis like this because nothing has ever happened before. Go into uh, Reverend Dr. Douglas's points. We also don't have systems that are really, uh, we don't spend a lot on these systems. So we don't expect them. We uh, sometimes we put in place things that makes it hard to get help. And so these systems aren't really set up uh, to serve people in a good time, let alone when they're under such incredible duress. Another thing that's different is how all encompassing this is. We're talking about every facet in life. In other times, you might see your job disappear, but maybe your child is still going to school. Maybe you have time to look for that next job. Maybe you have time to sort of get things together and get that unemployment insurance packet together. I mean, your child is still getting free and reduced price lunch at school. But in this case, the jobs just don't disappear. The schools disappear too, right? They close down. We lose access to incredibly important services at school. Technology uh, is very stratifying in this. So now, in order to keep getting an uh, education, right, we expect that kids are at home using a lot of virtual sort of technology. And we start to see that inequality, right, across all of these compounded inequalities uh, manifest itself. And we worry where uh, in the summers, we often see higher income kids sort of spring forward as they have uh, in, in nurturing enrichment type activities with kids uh, who have less access to those sort of fall back in the summer. Now we're talking about a six month summer, right? And then add in that the social services are strained, right? Not only do we have supply chain ch uh, challenges at food banks, uh, but a loss of volunteers too, right? Because a lot of those places tend to depend on um, older volunteers who are more vulnerable. So figuring out how are we gonna do that and how are we gonna make do when uh, food's getting more expensive and a bit harder to access. I wanna talk a little bit about the incredible stark racial disparities uh, in the COVID crisis itself, where in the state of Michigan, for the best data we have, we have about 14% of the population is, uh, is black, African-American. While it's 33% of the cases, and the last that I checked, 40% of the deaths. And so that is a tremendous disproportionality, right? And it's just um, a hugely an issue that I think we should all be incredibly concerned about. One of the things, uh, again, going on uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Douglas's remarks, we sponsor a survey. I'm a data nerd. I love to look at data. We are sponsoring a survey in the city of Detroit called VMAX that is a representative sample so we can know it really represents people across the uh, city, not just those who respond. And so we asked a set of questions about this just to get at this question of why, uh, what's causing this disproportionality. And what we see is that in the city, there is uh, incredible adherence to the social distancing um, uh, instruction that's being given. We see virtually 100% of Detroiters say they're living life differently because of this. A majority, a large majority are avoiding public spaces. Uh, virtually everyone is washing their hands till the bone pops through like uh, we're told to do. And uh, majorities are canceling uh, different activities, right? That we know are part of what we're expecting folks to adhere to. So that means we really have to look beyond the individual behavior to some of the structural causes. And I think a lot more research uh, is needed to figure out where those pinpoints are. But one thing I would raise up is the issue of water, right? Access to water is something we've been working with with the uh, health department, uh, very committed to that. But you're talking about a city that has had 20,000 households cut off of water over the last year. Right, and what does that mean? And then go into the question of who has what jobs, right? Uh, and what are people's ability to stay home? So we really have to look at those structural reasons and we have to think across all of these different facets because this crisis, the economic crisis is all encompassing. So I'm gonna end my remarks there, but I also wanna say that uh, I've been working with the city of Detroit. I guess I, I'm, I'm not gonna quite end my remarks just yet. I've been working with the state and I am proud of a number of the things that we've been able to do at the state in terms of an a moratorium on evictions, suspensions of water shutoffs. We were the very first state 
to get approved to provide extra food benefits to kids who are out of school and not, don't have access to free and reduced price lunch. So I'm happy to talk about some of that as we go on too. Dr. Schaefer, thank you so much. And I love that you had audio visual aids as well. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Bezold, um, your take on um, this pandemic and uh, the factor of poverty and how that's playing in. And thank you for your good work. Um, thank you very much, uh, please. Wait, wait. Try it yourself. There you How's go. That? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's really uh, a privilege to be able to speak with you all and to take a moment to kind of stop and reflect. I think it's important to acknowledge that I like public health officials around the country am in full response mode right now. And if any of you have ever been in the midst of, um, of a public health emergency or any situation like that, it can be really hard to think beyond the five minutes right in front of you. Um, and so I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you all tonight. Um, a lot of the things that I um, had been thinking about in preparation for this have already been kind of touched on by um, Reverend Dr. Douglas and Dr. Schaefer. But just to kind of walk through a few of the things um, that we see from the front lines, from this public health response when it comes to the intersection of this pandemic and poverty. And I think it starts with our recommendations around prevention. You know, we, um, we know at this point, the best thing we can do to slow transmission of COVID-19 is to stay home. And we know not everyone can stay home. And there are, there are very clear differences in who can stay home. And I think that's something that we think a lot about at the health department um, and we're not alone in this, right? So for those folks who can't stay home, who have an economic need to continue to work um, to support, you know, our critical infrastructure, as we call it, how do we support critical infrastructure workers, many of whom are in lower wage jobs? You know, that's, um, that's just the, the basic sort of first line infection prevention. Um, similarly, you know, when we're asking people to stay home, what does that mean? Well, we, we use phrases like suitability for quarantine, right? Places having a home in which you can stay for several weeks at a time is not something that is, you know, inherent for everyone. It's something that we have to think very carefully about, you know, what, what's the implication of telling someone to stay in their home if their home isn't set up for them to do so safely. Um, additionally, you know, staying home, especially for people who are older, means that there needs to be enough social support and social connection to ensure their basic needs are met. So um, all of those things are kind of baked into the basic infection prevention recommendations, which is, of course, you know, I think where we're, most of us are starting right now. Um, and something that, that if we're not mindful of, you know, we're, um, we know that it's a disservice to the community if we don't keep those things top of mind. Similarly, you know, the, the decision to close schools, great for infection prevention, great way to stop the transmission of a pathogen, has a lot of very real implications for people's lives. And so we're really very much in this push and pull constantly of what is best for controlling this infection and saving lives, and what is best for ensuring people's continued vitality and ensuring that those measures don't um, cause more harm than good. I mean, I think that, that tension is very real. And I, I want to also just acknowledge as we're talking about this, how much we don't know about this virus. And I think that's, that's hard as a scientist to, um, to admit and to deal with. I think that a faith community is a place where I hope I find some kindred spirits in um, acknowledging that uncertainty is, is just part of life and something we have to work with. But it does, it does mean that all of these decisions are, are judgment calls, right? Where we're weighing the coming pandemic or the, the very much here pandemic versus the real impact on human lives. Um, I do also want to talk briefly about the impact of, of the virus once someone is infected. And as, um, as has already been noted, there are a number of, um, you know, the, the, the little data we have is, is becoming quite clear that, that 
that disparities in health, that conditions like diabetes and asthma and heart disease and hypertension are significant risks for more severe outcomes, including mortality, hospitalization, um, all of the things we're trying to avoid. And so, so the people who were most vulnerable before this started are undoubtedly most vulnerable to the impacts. And a lot of our public health strategies then have to also be responsive to that. You know, we, we talk a lot about, again, to use another jargon to break down congregate settings, right? Places like nursing homes where people who are vulnerable live and ensuring that they're protected has to be part of the strategy. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is public health in general is designed to protect the most vulnerable. At least it should be on its, on its best days. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing here in this pandemic is, uh, someone said before, completely unprepared. Um, you know, I think the public health system wasn't the only system that was completely unprepared, but um, but we weren't as ready as we should have been. And um, and I say that as you know, as a scientist and an epidemiologist and someone who does this work, not on behalf of any particular organization, um, but just as as an epidemiologist, we weren't we weren't ready. And if our public health system isn't strong, um, that has huge impacts on disparities. It has huge impacts on on the population in a way that I think is um, is really coming to bear now. And, and it's something that in our immediate response mode, um, you know, we're trying to deal with each day as it comes. But when, when we step back and think about how we make this right in the long run, uh, I think that's got to be something that is part of the conversation. And that's that is really a central theme of public health um, is protecting the most vulnerable. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop and look forward to the discussion. And again, thank you for the, for the opportunity to talk. Yeah, no, thank you so, so much. Um, I, when, I, when I hear you talk um, about, about public health, I, I, I think about um, when my spouse was on a, uh, a board of directors for a hospital in another state um, and and they were trying to figure out um, cost centers and and I remember that um, that she said that uh, cardiothoracic was where they could actually make a profit um, and lots of other things kept getting cut and and I wonder in, if in our country we have focused so much on the the big operations and the response to someone being ill rather than the preventive um the preventive medicine and and i just wonder if and on some way like just we were kind of structured that way all the way across the board and i i don't know if that's if i'm wrong which i'm happy to be wrong but um your sense on that I don't think you'll find a public health practitioner in the world who will say public health is, is funded like it should be to really be robust. I don't, I don't think I'm um, really stepping, stepping too far out from the party line on that one. I think, um, yeah, you know, I think that I don't, I won't comment too much on, on sort of hospitals, but what I can say about public health is it is a good value, but it's at its best when you don't see it. And that makes it really, really hard to kind of rally people around. Um, and I think that, um, again, be in part because public health is, is a sort of safety net that is designed to ensure things like immunizations for everybody, regardless of their ability to pay. It's not always something that, um, that gets a lot of attention. And it is actually something that when it's going well, you forget it's there, right? When the water is clean and the air is clean and things are going well, you kind of forget that there are people whose jobs it are to, it is to to keep that going. That a whole system needs to exist to keep that going. So, I do think that um, that that you're right that we're not we're not structured in a way that is um, that's really robust when it comes to public health. Um, I think that is that is changing, and there are a lot of people who are working to to push that forward. But I think it it is. I hope that when we get through this, um, that there is there's an opportunity to say, you know, there's a, there's a value add from public health that it it does it does save lives even if you can't immediately see it, and and making that case is going to be part of I think our after action. 
Yeah, and, and that's what I think I'm thinking about, um, short-term and long-term in the midst of this. And, and um, Dr. Bezel, when you're talking about like what we don't see, um, Dr. Douglas, I'm thinking about um, the, the, the crucified classes of people was a phrase you used. And I'm thinking about that class of people that we just don't see. Um, yeah, that's right. Let me, say, let me just own that, that I don't always see. I'm, I'm not going to say we, I'm just going to own my stuff here. Um, so I wondered what just sort of short term, long term with this and, and about and to go with those classes that we're not seeing. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I exactly right. And when I hear that our public health system and many systems in this country weren't, re weren't prepared for this. When I hear that our public health system wasn't prepared for this kind of crisis, well, our country wasn't, as long as there is this kind of injustice and inequality in this country, we will never be prepared for this kind of pandemic. The crisis, health crisis will always be worse. For instance, as you spoke about schools having to close. Here's one example, and you got to close the schools, right? Because that in some ways prevents uh, the contagion from spreading, but we aren't prepared to do that when you have so many children that are dependent upon going to school for a decent meal, just one decent meal a day, or when those children are going to school so that their parents can go to work. And so when you have this kind of inequality, this kind of injustice, we're never going to be prepared. Or when you have people who don't have access or are afraid to indeed go uh, uh, and be checked or don't trust uh, the healthcare system. Uh, you say public health works when it is not seen or invisible. And, 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 and I think you're right, but it's only, uh, quote unquote invisible, which wasn't your word, I can't remember the word, but only not seen by those who have access to good health. Uh, uh, so that health, access to health and public health is invisible to those crucified classes of people. And so in the long run, we can't, when you talk about Bishop Perry of, being, of preventative uh, medicine to prevent this kind of crisis, we can't prevent there will be more pandemics. So mm -hmm. we, we can't prevent perhaps pandemics from occurring, but what we can do is prevent the kind of disparity that in inequality that impacts all of us. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that in the long run, we have to be talking about preventative measures that are justice oriented and bridging this gap of this kind of racialized uh, disparity. And, and for our faith communities, the, the role our faith communities have about naming those disparities. And then I, I think invoking um, what are our, our theological um, foundations, our scriptural foundations, love the Lord God with your heart, mind, soul, love your neighbor as yourself. How, how am I doing that? Um, and how, how is it that notion that um, uh, blessed are the poor? And, and how in God's name do we actually live that out? Um, yeah, I'll just say this briefly. And in, if, we, if we really believe that every human being that has breath is sacred, then we ought to treat them as such, right? And indeed what this pandemic has revealed, in fact, is that we're all connected. And so we're all a part of one human family. You know, what happens to someone across the country, uh, world impacts all of us. So for me, as a faith leader in faith communities, if we really believe that everybody is sacred, then we have to advocate for treating everybody that has breath as sacred. And what I often say and try to live by, we talk about the golden rule, is what I sort of call the reverse golden rule. Do not withhold from another 
that which you would not want withheld from yourself. And so all, all, all in there. So Luke, uh, Dr. Schaefer, you tell me, um, you study poverty all the time. Tell me, tell us if you might, one or two things that we can do short term and then long term. How do we fix the structures that have put this in place that some of our sisters and brothers are being annihilated by this? Um, yeah. So uh, I would say a lot of my answer does actually come from um, my faith and understanding that uh, I think we have a clear call to serve and, and be with those who are most vulnerable, but also to be in relationship with them. So I think right now there are a lot of different ways that people can make a difference. And I think this is a time when giving money is a really big deal, especially to social service agencies, especially to food banks right now. They're under incredible strain. And so we wanna make sure that we're putting our resources um, to use uh, during this time because they're gonna make a really big difference. I was just talking to two sets of people today who are looking to find ways to pay people's rent uh, for a period of time or provide them with money, right? As one of those very flexible resources people can put to service unto themselves. But I would also just encourage people to uh, write that check and, and put monetary resources, but also to try to be in relationship some, or try to get out of your own positionality and think about how this affects people in so many ways, seniors, who are uh, cooped up, right? Who might not uh, have families to share time with, who are lonely, who are most you know, vulnerable in terms of going out. Is there something that you could do there, right? And even just understanding what they're going through. Um, families with kids, right? Who you're connected to. This is a great time to try to make technology more accessible. Maybe that's a place of call for you. House cleaners, right? That is a big one, right? Where folks, especially folks who work off the books, may have trouble accessing unemployment insurance, although hopefully we're going to make it easier here with some of the changes that just came through. And uh, can I be thinking about still paying people um, for uh, the housekeeping, even though I'm not going to ask them to, to, to clean, right? So just trying to be in relationship and think about all the different ways people are impacted. Now, I'm a policy wonk, so when I think about what we have to do, uh, it goes to policy. And it is not a, uh, it's not an accident that our unemployment insurance system was serving the smallest fraction of unemployed workers before we hit this crisis in the history. Uh, we had some changes to unemployment insurance policies um, five or six years ago, and after that we saw it became much more difficult. And it's not just one thing, but many little things that were sort of embedded in the process that made it more difficult to access help. So this is a good time to be a little bit more engaged with those and be in relationship with somebody who's experiencing a spell of unemployment and say, what should we expect of them? In my own work, I'm working with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we have in the Economic Security Administration, a big focus on trying to simplify uh, the processes people need to get access to energy assistance through a program called State Emergency Relief, through cash assistance, food assistance, the programs that we have, right? And saying that we want to respect people's dignity and not stigmatize them as they come in because we're trying to be in relationship and trying to understand what's going on with them. So I would encourage people, and I think there are things, right, that we can do every day. There are big policy changes. Some people are talking about universal basic income, like huge changes that are gonna happen far off. And there are policy changes that we can be thinking about in a, the city where we live, uh, in the state where we uh, reside, right? That can make a difference that maybe we can do next week or maybe we can do in the next month. And so to me, it's a both and that we wanna do the things right in front of us. We wanna be in relationship with people and be looking at that long-term uh, arc and what we want to see for our country as we go forward. Thank you. That's, um, I, I just think, super helpful for um, all of us to be mindful of 
the people who normally would have been working with and for us and now aren't. It's like, oh, right? how, 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 do we, how do we truly all be in this um, together? As I am so aware that I have a salary and that I can, I, I, I can work on a screen and that I have sisters and brothers who, you know, who cannot work on a screen and they are out and about every single day. Um, I, um, I found myself um, wondering um, and being very clear as I was at the grocery store, I'm like, why are we not paying people more? I, 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 I have now, it is, I, I, it's like, oh my heavens, Bonnie Ann, why in heaven's name was I not doing more with the poor people's campaign? I mean, why was I not thinking of $15 for, for an, I mean, it's not that much. Why are we not paying people more? And, and that's a bit where I'm thinking about just where my efforts go um, with, with this. We've, we've, got, um, we've got some questions um, that I thought might be um, interesting. One of them says that, um, let's see, somehow, Oh, I used to have them, but now I, I don't. Oh, wait. Mm. All right. Well, um, I'm not sure where they went. All right. Well, here's what policy changes regarding welfare change since 1996 have included work requirements. Um, when the policies changes happen, could poor people be required to accept dangerous jobs in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in on this. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of my work is exactly on this question. And so I'm going to say a good thing on this front. And uh, what I would say is a not good, so good thing. The, the good thing is, um, at least in Michigan, we've been able to suspend work requirements on our cash assistance program. So they have been a, a part, an expectation. And uh, we were able to suspend those. I think we were one of the first states to do it. And the reasoning was, in particular, that uh, they are all, all wrapped up in that as a required to congregate. People have to go to orientation when they start out, uh, be at, at work. And clearly, we don't want that during this time. And at the federal level, we suspended work requirements on, uh, on food assistance, too. So those are two good things. But let me tell you, we now have research, some of mine contributing to it, on the welfare reform of 1996 that you mentioned to work requirements in food assistance and in Medicaid. And the overwhelming evidence is that the basic impact of work requirements is to shed people from roles. You see huge declines. So uh, Arkansas is a great example. When they impose work requirements on Medicaid, they had tens of thousands of people who dropped off the roles. And it wasn't because of work. It was because this was embedded in a, a system that was underfunded. People were confused. People who didn't think that they uh, had work requirements imposed on them were people who did think they had work requirements imposed and sort of gave up, didn't have them imposed. Uh, people couldn't access the internet to report their hours. And this is time and time again, when we implement work requirements on food assistance, we see people drop off the rolls. We also see no evidence whatsoever that it has any impact on work activity, partly because most people who are in food assistance are already working. And with cash assistance, there's a long history of that program that was a robust cash safety net for poor families with children is virtually non-existent. And in fact, I would say one of the interesting things is it doesn't appear really at all in any of the federal response. There's some good elements of the federal response, but that program has been killed so much that it wasn't even a part of it. So this goes back to our primary question, especially with health insurance, right? Do, if, if we want to impose rules that will keep people from having health insurance on a regular basis, work requirements are the right way to go. If we now wanna be in a society that says, you know what, maybe that's not what we should be doing. Maybe we wanna have people have access to health insurance so that when a pandemic hits, they're able to access healthcare, right? And maybe there's a societal need and there's also you know, a belief in uh, human rights, that healthcare is a human right. Then that type of policy makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, here's um, Kelly, I think this one might be one for you. It says, I'm a black woman raised at St. Cyprian's in Detroit, but now here in All Saints Lansing, but still very concerned with Detroit because my family, including my 96 year old mother and my son attend the church there. How can other congregations help resolve the crucifying conditions my people live in? Mm, that's a uh, long-term and a short-term uh, answer and question. First of all, I uh, agree with uh, Dr. Schaefer on this point that people have to reach out. And so say within our own denomination, our own faith community, uh, Bishop Perry, there are churches that are, and I don't mean simply endowed in the way in which we think of endowed parishes, but there are churches that are uh, less needy and churches that are very well off, more well off than other churches that are in communities that are privileged uh, and yet other churches that are on the opposite end of that spectrum. I think that in this time when we learn, when churches aren't able to gather and all of that, what, what we're really discovering is what it means to be church. And to me, what it means to be church has nothing to do with the building, uh, has worship's important, but it's not the singular, uh, the most important thing. It has to do about going to where the least of these are and serving and helping them in any way you can. So my short term response to that in the midst of this pandemic is that the people in St. Cyprian's or whatever uh, churches that uh, the woman is speaking of should not be a church trying to go through this alone in a, in a, in a community that in, uh, in and of itself is under siege by this pandemic, but was under siege in the first place by the crisis of inequality. So that other churches in that area and those congregations need to reach out and to support uh, a church like, I guess, uh, St. Cyprian's. And if I'm calling that church wrong, I'm sorry for that, but at least to reach out to those churches who are under-resourced and in communities of people that have been neglected. Uh, and so that's, the, that's the, the short term that one does in this, uh, in this current uh, health crisis. On the long term, we need to indeed understand what it means to be a part of a wider faith and church community and we should all have all along restructured ourselves to be church, uh, which means that we shouldn't have, you see the kind of inequality we're talking about within the country is the, is the very inequality we have within our own denominational structure. And so we are not in any way showing forth the way the world is supposed to be when in fact we have haves and have nots in our own church and faith community. That shouldn't be. And so we are, as Christians, we're talking about uh, uh, a God that we said comes to the least of these. Well, that's where our church has to insert itself. That's where, where it means to be church. That's what we have to do with faith leaders. So in the long term, we need to indeed speak to the inequality within our own faith communities. And if we do that, then we are indeed having an impact on the inequalities within our wider society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bezel, here's one for you. Um, this is a public health question. I serve in a congregation in Detroit that has a feeding program for marginalized persons. How and with whom can we partner for short term and long term to connect with the people with uh, health care resources, particularly mental health care? And I, I hope I got that right. Did that make sense to you? Wait, all right, go for it. Oh, you're still muted. There you go. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble. Um, yes, so the, the mental health impacts of, of 
this pandemic are something that we um, frankly need to be giving more attention to than we are. I mean, I think we're so, and I say we, I, I, I can speak only for the sort of public health practitioner community of which I am a part, we're so focused on, on a virus um, and the, the sort of immediate proximal consequences around that, but the, the extent to which um, there are, there's a need for mental health support is, it, it can't be underestimated. And so in terms of specific resources, um, I do actually have uh, a website I can share and I can type it in the comments after this, um, that is basically um, coordinated by a group of community leaders um, in the city of Detroit, trying to bring together all of these different sort of um, efforts that are going on around linking people to the services they need, mental health being one of them. Um, but the fact of the matter is that is something that um, that I'll connect to the resources that we have, but also that that we really need to do to be to be prepared to do more of for the coming weeks and months um, as this as this goes on and as we recover from it. I mean, I think you know we haven't even really talked about recovery from the pandemic, but um, when that starts to be something that we're thinking about, I think we we have to be really deliberate about ensuring an equitable recovery because I think there's there's going to be a lot of attention around rebuilding after this, and um, and and it's on each one of us to ensure that that we're pushing that recovery to lift up the people and the communities who are most, first and foremost, most detrimentally impacted by this by this crisis. So I will I will chat that link in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and here's one. Um, thank you. And I I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how. How, how can we work with people who do not have homes? I mean, because we have to do social distancing and, 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 and I think people are really trying to wrap their heads around both. How do we work with people who have no place to live? Um, and, and then just all of the, the um, inordinate mental health issues that are going with this. Um, and, um, and, and so thoughts on working with people who literally have no place to live and because we used to have them come in and be with everybody yeah. you know oh I'm, i just want to say quick, no. again this is an example of how a society like ours isn't prepared for a pandemic like this why do we have so many homeless people and that puts more of us at risk. I mean, so if you don't care about the homeless, then okay, be self-interested and care about yourself. But as long as we have homeless people with no place to go, then we're all at risk. The One of the uh, ir most ironic things that I heard during this crisis was a governor called, and it's doing a great job, I won't call the governor of the state, called for shelter in place and then said, uh, of course, except if you're homeless, but then I encourage you to find a place to shelter. And I'm like, really? Then why weren't we finding them a home and a place to shelter before this crisis? Then we wouldn't even have to have this question. What are we going to do about the homeless? Yeah. Uh, I would just say that uh, there are efforts uh, in Michigan uh, again, like not at all proportional to, to this, and it doesn't answer this bigger question, but around um, hotels and trailers and different ways to utilize the resources we have, uh, particularly for folks who may be at risk of infection. Uh, one big question is around uh, homeless encampments. And one of our team members at Poverty Solutions who works at the city of Detroit has been working on policies around encampments. Actually, it turns out uh, that the the best strategy that nationally that we can can we that we can find is that homeless campments should be allowed to continue. Like people, we shouldn't try to disperse a group of people at the moment. But if we can bring resources around, um, you know, hand sanitation or uh, you know, resources for um, for toilets and um, that sort of stuff. That's like the best thing in the moment. And then folks who are at risk of infection uh, that, uh, that need to be isolated, a lot of places, and Michigan is trying to be a part of this group, is looking at 
utilizing hotels, many of which are empty, many of which would like to keep people working, uh, to uh, have places for isolation. So some of that work is happening uh, in the city and it's not at all like we don't have the resources uh, that we want for all of that because of everything that we've described here. Um, but that's some of uh, that's some of where we're at. And, uh, and then there's a the broader question as we go forward and what kind of society we want to live in and whether or not we all, you know, get amnesia and forget about this, or we decide to make some real changes so this doesn't happen again. Yeah, I think, I think that's the big thing, right? Um, whether or not we get amnesia. Um, and then if we do get amnesia, then we won't remember that we got amnesia. Um, so that, uh, and so I, I, I really feel like that is the role of the faith community is to continually say, remember, we, we, we felt this, we heard this, we saw this, we longed for something different and then to put forth something different. Um, Dr. Bezold, um, if there, if you could think of, is there something that the city of Detroit could use from the, from the faith community um, besides prayer? Um, what, what would be helpful if you randomly could come up with that? And I may have put you on the spot and I apologize if that's the case. No, it's okay. I um, This is one thing that's been alluded to a number of times throughout this, but I think the the single best thing that the faith community or any community can do for each other is take care of each other. I mean, I, I think that this has really, um, one of the many things this pandemic has brought to light is the extent to which we are intertwined. I mean, this is, this has come up before, right? But, um, but take care of each other, check in on each other, figure out who is going, who is most likely to be disconnected um, in a situation where there's no, there's not a lot of social interaction and find creative ways to reach out. I mean, I think, you know, um, there was, uh, we talked earlier about sort of churches connecting with other churches, right? I think the fact that, that we can do church on, that in general, church can be done online, that that's the thing is, is wonderful, but, you know, that might not be the case everywhere. And so just really being, being deliberate about about taking care of one another is is just so vital right now. And then the other thing is is to advocate. I mean, to to push for some of these these policies that have come up. Right, some of these these critical underlying um, things like ensuring strong public health, access to healthcare, housing. Um, removing barriers to people accessing health care are continuing to advocate for those policies um, to the extent that it is it is in line with with any faith community sort of expectation is um, it's something that that frankly I think those of us who are working within the system sometimes need to lean on our partners to do. Thank you. Um, Luke and then um, and then Kelly. Um, Two sentences. Um, um, which, uh, what do you want to offer to folks who are? I've got an announcement, but two sentences or so on summing up your hope um, going forward. Well, I love Carla's uh, take care of each other, um, be uh, present with each other, and try to think outside of your position positionality, and then help me think about the structural issues and the concrete things that we can really change, small, medium, large, any given day. Thank you. And Dr. Douglas. Yeah, I echo uh, both of uh, the comments and responses. Uh, and I'll just say two things. One, in the immediate, churches need to stay closed. And uh, that is the ethical responsibility. Yeah. First, that that's, if we don't do anything else, stay closed because you don't need a building to be church. To open up uh, is to not be church. To stay closed is to be church because it means that you are taking care of those whom you claim to be sacred. So short term, stay closed. Uh, Long term, advocate, advocate for 
those people with their backs up against the wall and those people for whom they have no wall to put their backs and make sure that those people who have become most vulnerable don't become the most disposable after this, as we move through this crisis. Because my biggest fear is that as this crisis impacts disproportionately black and brown peoples and, and Native Americans, that when, though, when the uh, rest of society, if you will, feels no longer under threat, that the foot will be taken off of the pedal and that those most vulnerable and most expendable will then become disposable. And it is up to the faith community to make sure that that doesn't happen and to partner with persons like Dr. Schaefer and those that he works with and Dr. Bazold and who she works with to make sure that we have the proper things in place and the policies in place so as to stay closed and to advocate. Thank you so much. Um, so all of you, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I would, I've asked um, my uh, colleagues, um, Chris Johnson and Bill Danaher to also be on this call. Um, and um, if, if your happy little faces could um, show up on our screen, that would be lovely. Um, and what I wanted to announce, friends, is that um, we have put together in conjunction with, in partnership with All Saints Pontiac and with Christchurch Cranbrook and from diocesan funds, we have put together the Bishop's um, COVID Relief Fund and we have assembled um, $100,000 that we will be able to match dollar for dollar um, we will be able to match donations up to $100,000 um, for COVID relief. And what we would like to do is um, both a couple of our panelists mentioned that there are so many people who are suffering with food insecurity at this point. Um, people have lost their jobs, record numbers, um, and the need for food at our community um, kitchens, our food pantries um, throughout our diocese. Um, there's inordinate need for food at food pantries. So we're going to make, um, well, I would love to see us um, match that $100,000 with $100,000 um, from individuals. Susan and I will um, be making a contribution. And the way I look at this, friends, is if everybody who can writes a check for $100, then we suddenly have $10,000 and we can match that money. Um, Susan and I, are, are we've looked at our, our um, stewardship for this year, and we're going to be giving $1,000 to this. Um, and I would invite you to, to join me in this. I, I believe that the Diocese of Michigan can make a huge difference in feeding people in the midst of this um, pandemic. And that's a short-term piece for us to work on. Going forward, I really want to see us working on all of the structural issues because I believe they're gospel issues. Um, so that's what I am hoping to do and I hope that you will join with me um, and um, hoping that. Um, and I want to say thank you to um, Chris Johnson um, and the folks at All Saints Pontiac and to the people at Christchurch Cranbrook and um, Bill Danaher for partnering with me with this, um, because with diocesan funds and Chris and the people at Chris and Bill's churches, we have $100,000, match it funds, match it. We can make a huge difference. Um, so thank you very much. I would like um, also for you to please put on your calendars, uh, Wednesday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, and that, um, Eric, if you, who's been so ably helping with this, would you put the slide up? And Christchurch Cranbrook has got a um, webinar, and they're really going to be looking at um, issues of race and the pandemic and how we rebuild our community during and after COVID-19. And um, uh, 
Bill Danaher has put together, um, the Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist is going to be there. Um, and um, the state rep um, for his area is also going to be there. Um, and, um, oh, and Charles Christian Adams, who is the pastor of Hartford Memorial Baptist Church in Detroit, um, will be part of this conversation. I'll also be part of the conversation. So come and be with us as we continue thinking together in this time of sheltering and, and being safe. And, um, and let us also continue to um, pray for everyone who is ill. Pray for all of our essential workers um, at our grocery stores and driving trucks and cleaning floors and emptying trash cans in hospitals and treating people in hospitals and respiratory therapists and transport people and dietary people um, and nurses and um, nursing assistants. Um, are, let us pray for them and um, that they may feel God's presence and love and Thank you all very, um, very much for um, joining me in this conversation. And I want to thank again um, Kelly Brown Douglas and Luke Schaefer and Carla Basil for being with me and taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, thank you very, very much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>